It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. All right, Exploring Austria Part 2, where we will continue on with wine labels, laws, special designations, and of course, bubbly. We just can't get enough of Austria, can we, Val? No, Steph, that's right. In this episode, we're going to be talking about sec, baby. And speaking of not getting enough, I'm still sipping on the Austrian sec from part one. This is, again, the Steininger Gruner Wettliner 2013 Flaschengarung Niederösterreich Austria. And if you were listening in part one, you should now be able to tell me what Flaschengarung stands for. Steph, <laughs> do you remember? No, I don't remember. We didn't tell everybody how to spell sec either. S-E-K-T, not the kind of sect I bet you're all thinking of, but Flaschengarung means bottle fermented. That's what that means. So it wasn't produced in tank, but we'll talk about sect a little bit more later. Let's talk about what's in your glass now. Yes. So now I am switching over to a red and this is a cool blend. It's from Martin and Anna Arndorfer. And this is a, a blend that's called Forgesmack. And it's from the Niederösterreich, and it's 80% Zweigelt and 20% Pinot Noir, and runs about $20. And the aromatics jump out of this glass. Like, the Zweigelt is super wicked. And I have it in a, in a Pinot glass. This is day two. I opened it yesterday, and... I would definitely recommend this wine. It is, it's drinking very nicely on day two. So that says a lot, I think, for most wines, especially at that price point. So um, we are going to get into labels and laws now, guys. Oh, and God, that's exciting. I know, oh. right? You're like, yeah. oh, no, labels and laws and more of stuff trying to speak German. I don't know if I can handle it. That's why you're supposed to have wine with you. Okay, I know if you're driving, you can't do that. But still, let's let's talk about the wine laws of Austria because they're similar to those of Germany with respect to ripeness levels. And it makes sense to start here because we often hear them compared to them, kind of like what we were mentioning in part one. One of the main differences is that there's a quality pyramid like in Germany with the top level, Pradikats Wein, consisting of different ripeness levels of the harvested grapes. Are you following me? You've all heard the terms cabinet, spätlese, auslese, birnauslese, and trockenbirnauslese. Well, the Austrians actually do not include cabinet in the Pradikatswein quality tier. So that's uh -huh. kind of one of the differences there. Yeah. Yes, I remember sitting in Barry Wiss's CSW class in 2012 out in Napa. And that is like one of the few things that I do remember Yeah, was learning the difference between the German and the Austrian quality tier. So cabinet, it still exists in the Qualitatswein, but not in the Pradikatswein quality tier so but they do have other that the german product vine tier does not have thusly the austrian quality pyramid looks like this at the bottom you have the spatlese auslese up next then the beer and auslese then the ausbruch and then the trocken beer and auslese or what we're going to call tba and then of course strovine and we're going to talk about what those special wines are later Right. But we also have to mention the must weights are a little different than the German levels. And their scale is different, right? The scale of KMW versus Uxla. So before we talk about these strange new wines, I think, you know, Val just mentioned Ausbruch and the Strohwein levels. But you're like, what was KMW? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're going to back up the must wait truck here because KMW stands for Klauster Neuburger Mostwage. And what the, we're going to spell most it for wage. you. That's a Mostwage. Yes, it's must wait. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, spell it, Val. No, it I'm is. not going to spell it for you because it's a long <laughs> word. But must weight is defined as one gram of sugar per hundred grams of grape must. And we all measure must weight in one way or another. So the conversion for Austrian wines in degrees on the KMWs or the Klosterneuburg must wash scale is one KMW, which equals 1.2 degrees of what we in this country in America know as bricks on the Baume scale or on the German Uxla scale, five degrees. So one KMW equals 1.2 degrees bricks or five degrees German Uxla. And as I mentioned, the Qualitätswein category is also where we find the cabinet category. And I just wanted to point out to the listeners one more thing when we're looking at the different levels. You know how both the German and the Austrian scale has a Spatlese and Auslese. The one thing that I did notice when doing my research for this was that uh, Germany's minimum must weight for Spatlese is actually lower so it's 15.2 to 18 degrees KMW, where in Austria, it's got to be at least 19. Oh. So just, yeah. So I think that's interesting that Austria's must weights, minimum must weights are just a little bit higher. In Germany, it's 16.6 to 21 for Aschlese, where in Austria, the minimum is 21, starts at 21. So I think that's kind of interesting. So I just wanted to point that out. Well, it kind of goes to show that, you know, even though there are similarities, it's not exactly the same. It's not exactly the same. And remember, everybody, that it does depend on producer. Mm -hmm. You can get a Spadese from one producer in one part of either Germany or Austria that's going to be sweeter than another. Because remember, that's minimum must weight. Yeah. But I will say that Austrian wines are mostly, again, generally speaking, fermented almost all the way dry, many of them with less than four grams of sugar per liter. So you can bet that an Austrian Riesling probably will have, in most cases, less residual sugar than a German Riesling. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm hmm. Let's get back to the Osbruck and yeah, the Strohwein. Yeah, the sweet wines. Yeah, these are, these are both sweet wines. It's very good. And Osbruck Aus is a TBA level, Trockenbier and Auschlese level wine. So it's late harvested. It's moldy, funky, botrytized grapes that are hand-picked. And these wines can be compared to like the Sotern and some of the Hungarian Tokai dessert wines. And they are only produced in the geographical indication of Rust or the free city of Rust. So I thought that was interesting. And there's a whole page on there that we'll link up if you want to read more about them. I personally have never had one. I have not either. Yeah, it's nice to learn about these unicorn wines. But it's almost like if you think about a lot of those really like German Eiswein or the, you know, the German Torkenbier and Auslese, you know, those it, it's so labor intensive to make these wines that there are very few of them and they come in the little bottles. And so they're not as prolific and it's very hard to find these wines. Uh, Strohwein or what they call Schildwein is made from also fully ripened and sweet grapes. And they were dried for a minimum period of time on straw. Yeah. Hence the Strohwein or reeds. That makes sense. Yeah. So they're either laid out on straw mats or reed mats or they're hung up to dry and then they're processed or, or fermented. So the must weight on these, of course, is going to be a minimum of a 25 degrees KMW. Also, these wines may not be submitted to the Prumpfnummer Tasting Commission before April in the year following of harvest. So remember in Europe, just like all over Europe, just like Italy, just like France, just like Germany, they have production codes and laws that have dates and must weights and harvest and different restrictions that we just don't have here in the United States. Yeah, it's just so regulated. Yes. Speaking of regulated. Uh-huh. Well, that's kind of why we ended up doing this Austrian, which was going to be one episode, you guys, and you can see why and you can thank us that we split it into two. But the announcement of the 10th DAC is what inspired us to do these two episodes because the 10th DAC was announced mid-October 2017 and it's still October here for us right now. So the quick and dirty on what is the DAC and what do those letters stand for is Districtus Austriae Controllatus. And they're unique in that they have production rules laid out and predetermined styles of quality wine that 
are epitomized regional typicity. So in other words, what does all that mean that she just said? These rules are based on what grapes grow best in a specific region and how the wine made from them best represents the terroir. Aha. Okay, now that makes sense. These are all part of the qualitate vine level of quality. So just below the predicates vine. So what is the deal with all these DACs? Like what are which ones are where? And I think we mentioned all of that already. But if you hadn't listened to part one, we're going to kind of catch you up here real fast. Val? Yes, as, as Steph mentioned earlier, you probably heard her mention the different regions and the different DACs within the region. But what's unique in some of the unique aspects of these DACs is many of them have classic and reserve styles. Mm -hmm. Some of them have single vineyard designations. Each has rules with respect to grapes, residual sugar, and minimum alcohol content required to carry the DAC designation on the label. There are four DACs that are white only, and Steph had mentioned all of these in part one. So we're like, oh yeah, go back and listen to part one. And the white only DACs, they go back as far as 2002. Okay, 2002 vintage. So the DAC program was actually established in 2003, but the earliest ones go back to 2002, and they are the Weinviertel, which is all Gruner, Berliner, and Krumstall, which is also effective as of the 2002 vintage, which is Gruner, Berliner, and Riesling. And then the Treisenthal came along in 2006, Gruner, Berliner, and Riesling, and Kamptal came along in 2008. Gruner, Veltliner, and Riesling. So those four are white-only DACs. Now, we also have three red-only DACs. And I think these are exciting. I actually went looking for some of these and couldn't find any, but the one that came along first as far as red-only was Mittelbergenland, and that was in 2005, and that is all Blau Frankish. Then mm -hmm. in 2008, we had the Eisenberg Reserve. And then in 2009, the Classic was allowed to be made at the DAC level. Classic with a K. Classic with a K. That's right. So Eisenberg, 2008 for Reserve, 2009 for Classic, and that's all Blau Frankish. Then in 2011, we had the Neusiedersli Zweigelt. And that, again, is the second most popularly grown grape in all of Austria, about 9% of the plantings there. One DAC is for red and white, and that is the Leithaberg. And the red was actually authorized in 2008, and that can be made from Blaufrankisch, Saint Laurent, Zweigelt, and Pinot Noir. And then the Leithaberg white came along in 2009. Gruner, Veltliner, Riesling, Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, and Neuberger. And then we get to the really interesting animals here. The, their own animals, Germister Sots, came along in 2013. And we talked about this one a few episodes back when we talked about field blends. That was in episode 131. Yeah. These grapes must grow in a Viennese vineyard planted with at least three quality ripe varieties, as we mentioned before. I'm sure you guys don't remember, but they also have to be harvested and pressed together. And Viennese, just so right now, means it's from Wien. Or Vienna. Right. Is it from that specific or, or yeah, Wien. I always want to say wine, but it, you know, wine. Yeah. But it's Wien. And the biggest portion of a single grape variety must be no more than 50% of that blend with the third largest portion only being at least 10%. But this is what we're really excited about. We are like... Yeah, what happened this year? We're tickled pink. We're tickled pink <laughs> about the rosé only DAC. This is called the Schilcherland, which Steph mentioned earlier. It's 2017. It's rosé only. And what? Made from the Blauer Waldbacher grape. It's in the Steiermark. I always said Steiermark, but it is the Steiermark area, as Steph mentioned earlier. Many of us think of Schilcher as meaning a rosé vine. Rosé vine. Now I'm getting it. I speak the English. A it's like your W's and your V's are like all starting to get scrambled together. The W's, the V's, the I's and the E's are all reversed. Mm -hmm. And then the rosé wine, but the term Schilcher actually means everything from glitzy to iridescent to shimmering and glittering from the German word Schillern. So it's like pink wine bling. I bet the, like the Pink Society and all of these other cool rosé groups would like that. 
Absolutely. I love anything pink. I think when I retired, I, I was swearing to just wear everything pink that I could. It's <laughs> my favorite color. So pink wine bling it is. <laughs> if that wasn't complicated enough, Val, what else have we got in Austria? Well, they have some other classifications as well. The Wahau has their Vinay Wahau for dry wines, and they are from specific growing areas defined by law. The Vinay Wahau was created in 1983, although the name Vinay Wahau Nobilis Districtus has its roots in the 13th and 14th century under Luthold the first von Kuhnring. So there are three styles unique to the Vinay Wachau, and you've probably seen these either on an exam or will see them on an exam. The first being could show up in a tasting. So Steinfeder, which is kind of a feather grass native to the region. The Federspiel, which is a bird, otherwise known as a falcon treat. So basically these are raptor food. These are what they feed <laughs> the falcons during falconing, oh, no. I know. And then there's the maragd, and that is smell. And most of us say smaragd because we don't know any better. S M A R A G D, but it's actually pronounced maragd, and that's the lizard. And it hangs out in the vines, and you'll see these little critters or grasses or flora and fauna on the labels. But these wines are graduating in power and structure and alcohol, and they become richer in style, respectively. So it is not out of the question to see all three of these or one of these on an exam. And Marakt is the uh, most powerful. Yes, that is the most full-bodied, highest in alcohol. Of course, those things go together. There's also another organization, the Traditional Austrian Wine Growers, established in 1990. And they are responsible for creating the Erstelage Association with Growers from within the Kremstal, Kamptal, Trisental, and Wagram as the Erstelage or First Growth Vineyards. Erstlage or First Growth Vineyards were established by the 23 panel members of the Association of Traditional Vineyards of Austria. I'm not going to pronounce that what they call it. <laughs> in May 2010, after nearly 20 years of consideration, the 23 members panel incorporated 52 vineyards. Their focus obviously is on vineyards and sites in addition to quality of wine, where the DAC rules are more focused on wines, characteristics from senses of place. So they still support the DAC laws, but their philosophy is everyone knows that you can make a great wine only out of a great vineyard. It's kind of Burgundian, right? Kind of like... It is. Know. This is a very similar philosophy to the German Erslage in the Rheingau area with the Rieslings and the Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Have you had a lot of Erslage? No. No, I haven't either. I have not had a lot of them. But should we get to it? Yes. I mean, you're... This is your jam, man. Let's go. Let's move on to the bubbly time. I, I wish I had some bubbly with me to do this. I wish you had some of this because this is this is almost like a full bodied bubbly. Ooh, I didn't talk about it earlier, but it's got a lot of the the fruit still. Remember, I said it was a 2013. It's got a lot of the apple, got a lot of the pear, but it's still got nice fresh acidity considering it's four years old. But it also has a nice body in her, and it does have a little peppery finish, which is interesting because it is a Gruner mm -hmm. Veltliner. But this is called Sect, S-E-K-T. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Sect, baby. Let's you talk about and Sect, me. baby. Oh, I mean yeah. Sect, baby. <laughs> <laughs> And we're sorry. Austrian bubbly doesn't get much attention, but it has its own quality pyramid since 2015. And the different levels determine whether bubbly has to be produced via classic method or traditional method or tank or charmat, as well as the qualified styles. So got this pyramid in your mind. And at the bottom, we have what we call the classic, also with a K. It can be produced either tank like Prosecco or classic, or even transfer, which is a whole other method, which I believe we talked about in our bubbly episode. And it can be in any style, any sweetness level. It's like free range bubbly. I'm talking even a Cabernet Sauvignon bubbly. And yes, there are producers that do this. It is only released after the 22nd of October, the year following harvest, and vintages are permitted on the label, even though no stated origin is required. Uh -huh, and this is for the classic. This is for the classic. Okay. And then the next level up 
is the reserve. This is classic production bottle fermentation only, which is what, kind of what I'm drinking right now, even though this was produced way before the quality pyramid. So this this wine that is in my glass doesn't come under these categories because it was made before then. Because it was 2013. It's a 2013, right. And this pyramid came along in 2015. So for the reserve, if you see that on the label, the Flaschengering is mandatory or the bottle fermenting and bottle aging. So it has to have at least 18 months time on the lease. There is no blending of red and white for this level, and the wine can only be released after 22 October, the second year following October. Ooh, he's got some rules on this one. They do, and 22 October is an important date, so just kind of stick a pin in that date, because we're going to get back to why that's important, and I wish we'd been recording this on that date, but, you know, my wheels didn't turn (laughs) that fast when we're putting our episodes together. But at the top is Grand or Gross Reserve, which must be only brute nature, brute, and extra brute styles. Okay. So it's very, very restrictive. 30 months time on the lees, and it has to be classic method. It is mandatory, as is hand harvesting of the grapes. It is the strictest category, and these bottles are not released until 22 October, the third year after ha- uh-huh. harvest. I see a pattern here. There is a pattern. So like I said, stick a pin in that date. But if we go all the way back to the 1800s, it was Robert Alwyn Schlumberger. And you might have heard that name because he was the first person to produce sect in Austria in 1842. He learned how to make champagne from the Ruinart cellar master. And of course, Ruinart, as we know, is what stuff? Delicious. (laughs) It is delicious. It is the oldest champagne house and he eventually became the production manager there. So the styles are varied. Red, white, rosé, dry, sweet. Rosé is becoming very, very popular. And the Schilcher, remember that word? Schilcher sect is a specialty. So that would be the pink bling that we talked about earlier. Although it, that's not, you know. But they use the autochthonous Blauer Waldbacher. Remember this variety from the Schilcherland DAC. Well, I wonder how much of it is exported. I've never seen it, but that doesn't mean anything because our market is totally different yeah. where we buy our wine. And I know my purveyor, Dirk, who has agreed to come on the show, and we're going to have a retail episode eventually, but he does stock a significant amount of Austrian wine because he goes there, he loves it, he loves the bubbly, and so I am fortunate to get wines that maybe some people can't but again it's just a matter of what sells yeah ask him about if he can find some of this cool stuff when he goes next time hopefully yes and then for the holiday and of course he'll order you know if he can get his hands on it through ordering we can order yeah. anything as well yeah you just sometimes you just have to have the the right supplier you know you just have to have the right relationship to get this stuff absolutely but other sect fun facts for you today uh, most sect wines have traditionally come from the Weinverto region, bordering the Czech Republic. There are 36 grapes, like Seth mentioned earlier, 22 of them white. Whoops, 14 red. Yes, 22 of them white, 14 red, including Cabernet, approved for sect. But the main groups are going to be the main groups. The main grapes are going to be Gruner, Pinot Blanc and Welsh Riesling. Of course, the minimum atmospheres of pressure in a bottle is about 3.5 atmospheres, and there are about 12 million bottles produced. So what about the 22nd of October? Yeah, let's get back to that. You put We put pins in it because you told us to. We put pins in it. We did. We put pins in it because that is actually the day of Austrian sect. And this is from Advantage Austria Doc. Org. And they say that October 22nd signals the beginning of the sect high season. We're in the middle of sect high season, Uh-oh. Steph. What does that mean? Well, Do you have to get it. extra glasses? We're going to have to because that, remember, the 22nd of October is when those bottles are released to the public. So what they've done is they've named this Austrian sect day. So on this day, according to Advantage Austria, consumers and sect lovers can find out about the product, the production methods, try different kinds of sect and get to know the facets of Austrian sect by attending open houses and sect sellers. So if you're in Austria, this is probably what's going on. I it came and went this past weekend, and I didn't even know it. So this would have been Sunday. You know what's kind of crazy is that in part one, I talked about the history of Riedel, but Riedel also makes a 
Austrian sect glass. Of course, because they're Austrian. And they, you know, of course, but they do have that, just so you know. All right. So I think that's a good thing to have on our Wino Radar for next year. But because we missed it, let's talk about Wino Radar this oh. year, because I think we've Austrian wined everybody <laughs> out right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, are your brains scrambled? Well, you're not alone. But they've turned us you off. You know, this is where you can, you can, uh, <laughs> re-listen to these episodes and really go okay I got the first part now I'm going to listen to that again and get the second part but I want to go back to the wine that I'm drinking because now this is something that's on my radar so on the back label of the bottle that I've got here which is the Zweigelt and Pinot blend is it says that this is a bottle imported by indie wineries and since i like it so much i thought well i've never heard of indie wineries and it's i-n-d-i-e wineries.com they have a really cool portfolio and represent small producers all over the world like croatia slovenia portugal austria obviously and others and they're really no joke i mean they've been given some press in the psalm journal and in the huffington post and so for me sometimes when i'm shopping for wine i kind of verify a purchase by looking at who the importer is because if i'm familiar and i like what they have in their portfolio traditionally then I feel a little bit more confident in in buying that. So I just wanted to let share that information with everybody because I'm going to be looking on the back label and seeking out some of these bad boy bottles that they've got. Pretty cool. Very nice. Yeah. And my shout out goes to a producer in South Africa that Val has visited because she was just telling me when we were pre-gaming. It's the first time I've had it. It was a hashtag W25 challenge for me. Hamilton Russell Vineyards in South Africa. I came across a Pinot Noir from the 2012 vintage from this estate, which is in the Hemel... Himmelenard. Himmelenard Valley. I just wanted to make sure I pronounced that right. Now we're not speaking German anymore. Now it's Dutch. <laughs> yes. So anyhow, my curiosity and intuition really just kind of forced me to add that to my shopping cart. It was so killer. I It's a $40 bottle and it reminds me of you know Burgundy and is a very classy gift, I think. I mean, a lot of people, I remember when I was at at the pharmacy, a lot of my friends and colleagues would ask me, you know, like, hey, I'm looking for something to give as a Christmas gift or, you know, that's not too expensive, but isn't a cheap wine. This to me, because it's under $50, it's a really good statement wine to give to somebody. And uh, that's just my two cents. But Val, what's your two cents on Hamilton Russell? I have such a soft spot in my heart for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from the Himalayan Valley, which means heaven on earth. Oh, is that right? Yes. And if you've been there, it is one of the most beautiful places you will ever see. And I actually had the pleasure of having lunch with Anthony and Olive Hamilton Russell on their back veranda overlooking this gorgeous property well that doesn't suck i'll post a picture it is absolutely stunning the food was amazing they have the coolest bathroom ever really i remember the bathroom the artifacts in the bathroom there's a lot of geology and anthropological things going on in that that old area of the world remember south africa has some of the oldest soils yeah they don't have the limestone of burgundy but the wines i would say are some of the finest pinot noir in the world it's so I, cool how beautiful oh. places make beautiful wine. And I still think that Cape Town and the wine areas and the wine farms, you know, of South Africa rival in beauty to any other place I've ever visited in the world. I just didn't get to go to Hamilton Russell like you did, but man, I can't wait to go back. Did you go to Bouchard Finlayson, his neighbor? No. See, I got a whole nother trip ahead of me. Absolutely. Those are two 
very much if you're a Pinot lover or Chardonnay or a Burgundy lover, Bouchard Vinlayson, Peter is an amazing their tasting room is it's in this cellar and it is just gorgeous. And then Hamilton Russell, I am so in love with that part and, and enamored with South Africa that you cannot again, just the fact that it comes from a place called heaven on earth and you're giving that to somebody as a gift. That's absolutely a stunning wine. They're still approachable. Yeah. There are a lot of things about Burgundy wines that people are like, oh, yeah, they're funk and mushroom and ick and brett. Uh, they don't mess with that. They don't mess with the brett there. And it's just so beautiful, the wines and, and the place. Yeah. So the wine has a story. I, I'll put a picture of this view. I can. I was. I felt like I was in heaven, and it is just one of those places I would go back to if I could every year. But uh, speaking of love, yes, yeah, speaking of love, our heaven on earth sometimes is just really podcasting together with uh, the help from our patrons who support this show. So lots of love to our tenacious tasters, Jeff E from We Like Drinking Podcast, Lynn from Savor the Harvest, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours. Jen in Maryland and the world and check out her Instagram, you guys. David and Lisa in Illinois are It's Not Five O'Clock and We Don't Care patrons. Meg in South Dakota, Clay in Arizona. Can you tell I'm smiling? I'm just like laughing at myself right now. Okay. John, Andrew, Aswani in California, Chantel in Ontario, Mary Lou in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Georgia, and in Colorado, Diane and Chris and Janet in Illinois. We have Renee and Steve, Kathy in Tennessee, Ashley in North Carolina, and our Tastemaker listeners, David in Scotland, Carol in Kentucky, and Karen in California, and our Winetastic listener, Laura. We are here for you every week. Between episodes, you can find us on the social spaces at Wine to Five, and we encourage you to join our private Facebook group. There's a lot going on in there. It's called the Wine to Five community. You can connect with me. I'm Val. I'm on Twitter at Wine Gal Unboxed. I'm also on the Vino with Val Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest places. You can connect with Steph on Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram as the wine heroine. But I know you're glad that that's all we have, but we will be back next week with some more fun. So until then, yeah. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash wine T-W-O five and tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips. 